So we will begin with Luke chapter 2. And today we'll only look at the one verse. Um, we'll read two. Luke chapter 2, verse 39 and 40. So the context before that is the parents of Jesus have come into the temple. They have taken the baby Jesus for the blessing, for the circumcision, to do all that which was culturally done and done by the law. The prophecies concerning the destiny of the child have been given. Simeon has blessed the parents. It's interesting that Simeon, whose name is related to Shema, which is meaning the law, to hear the law. He comes, he blesses the parents of Jesus. He doesn't bless the baby. Why? Because the law had come to an end. The priesthood under the law was coming to an end. There was one that was coming in a different spirit. As it says in John 1, 14, he was coming in the spirit of grace and truth. That does not mean that the law was of no effect and it was now done away with. He was coming to fulfill every aspect of what the law had pointed towards. The law had a truth in it. The law had a grace in it. But there was coming something greater than that. And so Simeon blessed the parents. He didn't bless the child because the child was greater than he. So we see that Simeon blessed the parents. We see that Anna prophesied and Anna or Anna is means grace filled. Now the law had ended. Simeon represented the ending of the law. Hannah represented the beginning of a grace, the new grace that comes in Christ Jesus. So that is the background context. Now we read verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I'm going to repeat verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, when I read this, the word strong in spirit jumped up at me. I had never seen it just quite like this. I'd always read it, and the child grew and became strong. Meaning, little baby Jesus, meek and mild, grew up to become a strong man. That's how I was reading it. And just passing over what is written. The thing is, as you recall, Right in the beginning of the beginning of this study of Luke, 
I pointed out to you that Luke is not just giving us a narrative, an account. He put together this thesis to explain the reason of the gospel with its application. In the book of Acts, it's the demonstration, the outworking of the gospel because he begins the book of Acts by saying the first treaties I wrote to you. So this isn't, oh, I best make a nice account of all the things, uh, you know, um, because I'm an academic, uh, I will do it academically, you know, I'll put in evidences. He was not thinking like an academic, although he was one, he was a doctor. So yes, as a physician, he would have been trained. He understood how to put things together. So why did a physician have to state the obvious? And why does he state that the child grew. Yes, doctor, thank you very much for that. Every child does grow. What are you pointing out? And became strong in spirit, not strong physically, strong in spirit. Now let's hear what Luke is saying concerning that. And nowhere else in the Bible is this mentioned except of John the Baptist in chapter 1, verse 80, where it says about John the, the Baptist, so the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now, here we begin to see something. Okay, so John the Baptist had a destiny, and he was kept from the sight of the community, the majority, the eye of the priesthood of those days, he was kept under wrap in the deserts. If you go back and you see that which had been prophesied and confirmed to his father, Zechariah, and confirmed by his father, Zechariah, concerning his life, and all these people that marveled, it says, the people marveled, what manner of child is this? And he grows up in the deserts. He grows up away from attention. Why not live in one of the biggest cities? Why Nazareth? A small little place where the child Jesus goes to grow for about two years, then down to Egypt. And he grows away from the investigating eyes. There's a reason for it, and I will get into that later, but what I want to concentrate on now is that he grew strong in spirit, and there's a clue here filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So there came a grace upon Jesus, and it was this grace 
that was ministering to him, developing him, developing his wisdom to live in a world that was not welcoming to his message. John 1.14 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. He was filled with grace and truth and his own did not recognize that in him because they were framed in the law and they were staunch, made of concrete. Their minds just grasped law. And here God was saying, you've actually missed the point of the law. You need to have found me in the law. But all you can do is law, law, law. In other words, your rituals and your regulations, your rules are sufficient for you. You didn't see that those rituals and rules were there for you to understand how to walk in holiness in relationship with me. The point of the law was never that if you practice this and that, then you got it. The point of the law was in relationship with God, you don't do things that are harmful to you. And that still is the point. Whereas in the Old Testament, they needed to go up to Jerusalem annually for Passover, for the sacrificing of the lambs and rams for their sin. Now we don't get to go to Jerusalem. We go to the cross. We go to the feet of Jesus and we confess our sin to him. And this is the point that in relationship with Jesus, we go to him who is the Lamb of God for the forgiveness of our sin. And we walk in the ways that we need to in order to be relating to him who is holy. Sin separates man from God. So we need that grace of God to walk in grace, to walk in the wisdom that comes from him, to be in relationship with him victoriously. Not, oh, I didn't do this or that right, and now this and that has gone wrong in my life. I must be punished. He's punishing me. And this is not the truth. So understanding what this strength of spirit is, we need to understand that strength of spirit isn't personal determination. Like, you know, some people have this amazing determination that they are not going to drink coffee and they're not going to drink tea and they're not going to have chocolates and they are going on a diet and man, the kilos fly off of them and they will not be tempted. They are just, they are resolute. They've got this incredible will. They strong minded. Let me point out to you, being strong-minded 
is not being strong in spirit. So that excuse that says, I'd really like to do that, but I am not strong. <laughs> I'd like to serve the Lord, but I'm not strong. Hold on. Strong in spirit has got nothing to do with your own personal ability to do something, with your determination, with self-will, none of that. Strong in spirit is the grace that comes from him. Now, that grace you have to tap into. You don't get to tap into it because um, you hear about it. You tap into it because you pursue it. So although you may be weak, although you may not be strong in any sense of the word, the minute you determine, I am going to rely upon the grace of God. In that moment that you are feeling weak, in that moment that you are shaking in yourself, in that moment that you are stressed, in that moment where your physical body is talking to you through pain and you say, I will rely on the grace of God. I am not self-reliant. It doesn't depend on my strength. It depends on His grace. And His grace is sufficient for me. The shop, if God had a shop selling grace, the shop never closes always open 24 7 and i am not telling you anything that i don't practice the moments when i am overloaded with work but another bomb goes off another crisis needs my attention here someone needs prayer. That other person decides that they're going to flip their lid. How do you minister in all those circumstances? Because our life is a life of ministry. Every one of us. We are not called, you know, those that are leaders are called and they minister. Every one of us, every woman listening to me now, God has ordained you as a minister in your household. And I will prove this to you by the word. You are a minister in your family, in your household. And let me just put it to you this way. When God finished making Adam out of the dust of this world, he turned around and said, it is not good. Only time God comes to a conclusion that something wasn't good was when he saw Adam, it is not good that he is alone. Something was insufficient and he made Eve out of him and brought her before him as a minister, ladies, as a minister. A minister unto him. Now, I, you know, the word minister can also be interpreted as servant. So I must just clarify it straight here. I'm not saying that women 
are men's slaves, that they are the servants of men. There's a very big difference between serving someone and ministering to someone. Huge, huge difference. How do you minister? When the husband and the children are exploding and they can't cope with this and they're going to do that and they drop the bombs here and they drop the towels there and they don't pick up after themselves and they got their nose out of joint. Who's the minister in the house? The woman that God prepared and brought to place before them. So it is in that context that I'm talking about being strong in spirit and leaning very strongly on the grace of God to fulfill that role of being a woman um, that is a minister in the household. Now, I just want to um, give you some insight into this word strong in the Greek. Sometimes Greek and uh, most times Greek words and Hebrew words paint pictures for us. So I'm about to paint you the picture of the word strong in the Greek. And the King James actually says it well, um, the old King James, in that it says he, um, he grew up uh, and became uh, strong in spirit. It says he waxed strong. He waxed strong. There's the picture for you. Loads and loads and loads of lotion. You've seen on TV where uh, these athletes, uh, especially before the boxing ring, they get massaged. They get filled. And, you know, there's just so much. Um, creams and lotions and what, they get properly waxed. Here is the purpose of wax. It makes you impermeable. When you are covered in wax, water runs off. So, Here's the picture of what being strong in spirit looks like. You get your spirit coated by this grace of God, by the spirit of God in such a way that you are impermeable. The spirit of this world, the disgust, the pressure, the darkness of this world runs off of that wax to not penetrate your heart and damage it. Now that is becoming strong in spirit. You know, John the Baptist grew up in the desert and in those days, those that were walking lively with God chose to go and live in the deserts where they would not be persecuted by the stale religion that was practiced in those days. That is why people went out to the deserts to be baptized in water because that which was lively about God was happening far away from where the establishment of religion was enthroned and ruling. 
Jesus did not grow, grow up in Jerusalem. He grew up away from the prying eye. And he remained so protected until the time of his coming forth when he was 30 years old. So many times we look at our own lives and um, I want to say that God may have had you in certain deserts in your lifetime. You know, some congregations for me were deserts that I was hiding in where God was building me up as one Bible school uh, professor that I had said that many times you come to Bible school and you think you're coming to learn what to do. But he says, I promise you, most of what you are going to learn here is what you should not do. And I know that there are many of you that are hearing me who have been in desert congregations. What was God teaching you there? What was God building up in your spirit? How was he making your spirit strong? Like John the Baptist, like Jesus, for a time such as this. As Claire taught the other day, Esther, what's the deal? A time such as this. You think God hasn't got Esthers on earth anymore? I'm looking at them. For a time such as this, inside your palace, inside your household, God wants you to be the one that is strong in spirit. He wants you to pick up that which you picked up in the deserts of your life, that which was the working of his spirit in you. And he's wanting to blow on those coals, on those flames inside of you that you might end up a roaring fire inside that household where you are. So now that we see that the purpose of being waxed strong is to be impermeable for the world, the spirit of the world, to not penetrate your spirit, that you not love the world. It is not possible to love God and love the world at the same time. And I did not say that. One John says that. The Apostle John, who walked with Jesus and reached at a ripe old age, that's what he said. He that loves the Father, the love of the world cannot and won't be in him. So impermeable. The spirit of this world will war against our spirit and weaken us. So the process of becoming strong in spirit is First of all, becoming waxed, strong, impermeable to the spirit of this world and identifying where that spirit is because that spirit hides under the cloak of religion. It did back then 2,000 years ago and it has and it does so now. So the spirit of this world is benefiting for itself. It is self-centered. So everything 
thing that has to do with the spirit of God is God centered, is Jesus focused, and it is grace filled. It is not possible to walk in that which God expects us, which is to walk in the spirit. It's not a suggestion. It says in Romans 8, walk in the spirit. It doesn't say. Now, dear brethren, I suggest to you that it is far more beneficial to walk in the spirit. Just cut all that goofiness of pampering little children. These are not little children. We are grown ups and Paul, the apostle, addresses grown ups and he says there is no condemnation. And then he goes on and he says, walk in the spirit. He's talking to grown ups. We need to grow up and out of that. I am so weak, so dependent. We are dependent on God. And that is our sufficiency and our inefficiency, inefficiency, both. Because the minute we are not sufficient and we rely on God and on his grace, there we are, straight away, sufficient. So now, following on this thought of being strong, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to read... Verse 13, and um, we'll see how far we get. Now listen to this language. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you. Gonna stop there. Watch. When do we say watch? When there's danger. Correct? Watch. Watch for what? Watch out. Watch. Why? Because there's danger. We live in a world surrounded by danger. We are in danger all the time. In danger of the spirit of this world creeping into our hearts. The spirit of this world and the mindset of this world creeping into our minds and causing our minds to becoming feeble. If we are strong in spirit, reliant upon the grace of God, our minds will be made strong. We will not be feeble in our mind. What does it mean to be feeble in our mind? It means we won't start having this self-talk. I can't do that. Oh, I feel so tired. I can't cope with this other thing too. <laughs> hey, I could have a pity party because I've got plenty reasons. But I made a decision that it's not nice to go to your pity party alone. And I've never found people that wanted to come to mine. They only want me to go to theirs. So put an end to the pity party. Because the only audience we get at pity parties is Satan himself. He causes the pity party and then he sits around to have a good laugh. 
Uh, look at the image of God suffering, not knowing that the glory of God is there within their reach. How dumb the creation. You think he doesn't talk like that and think like that? He hates us. So when I figured that out, I realized Susanna's not having any pity parties because the devil and the demons that came to deliver the project for me to get into a pity party, they standing about waiting for me to cry so they can laugh. And that's the truth. So they can mock. Oh, they're supposed to be people of faith. Look at all of that. God's not coming through for them. God's not coming through for them. You know? Ha ha! This is what the Bible says. When the enemy comes at you in one way, they shall flee in seven. You know how that works? They will come. But when you put on this impermeable, strong spirit that is filled with the grace of God, you are going to have fun watching demons fly in seven different directions. And I, I tell you, I, I love watching little ladies make the devil flee in seven different directions and guess where it happens best in your home and when we get it right in our home in our households the church in britain is going to be revived christine dog um is that how we pronounce the name i'm not sure that's how i say it but if you are on that Facebook, it says Britain will be saved by praying woman. It's not going to be praying woman that are meek and mild like a little child baby Jesus. It's going to be woman who understand what Luke is saying here in chapter 2 verse 40 that this little baby Jesus in the manger grew and became strong in spirit filled with the wisdom and grace of God and that's the Christ that lives in you and me what the devil didn't understand the day that he had Jesus crucified was that all over the world there would be millions of Christs being resurrected. And that's what we need to be preaching in our pulpits. Christ resurrected in you. He did not only come out of the grave, he is coming out of each one of us. Be strong in spirit. This is what it means. Watch. Watch against what entangles us in the world system, the world way of thinking. Then it says, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. The Bible school at this moment is on faith. Chris is teaching on faith. Stand fast. Don't sit down. Don't take a break. Stand like a soldier will. You know, the Queen's God stands fast. I've seen kids being absolutely naughty to try and see if the God would blink 
saying naughty things to see if they would smile and they stand fast. Stand fast in the faith, not in the courage, in the faith. And you're being taught how faith originates in Jesus. If you haven't got enough, you go to Jesus and you ask because he is the author, the developer, and the finisher of our faith. So if we haven't got, we get. We, he gives us his grace freely. And then it says, be brave. It's a command. Be brave. In other words, stand up against those things that are withstanding the power of God. The spirit of this world and its thinking and everything that it upholds, it withstands the kingdom of God. It's resisting the kingdom of God. It is putting pressure against the kingdom of God. And so the Bible is telling us here, be brave, stand against it. As it says in Matthew, it's the kingdom suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. Do not put up with the resistance that comes from the power of darkness. And I reiterate, you know, one of my pet subjects is the Bible nowhere in the Greek and old translations does it say that the kingdom of God, uh, I mean, the kingdom of darkness, it talks about the power of darkness. There isn't a kingdom. They want to create a kingdom, but they, there is no such thing as king of darkness. God did not crown Lucifer a king. Therefore, there is no kingdom of darkness darkness there is the power of darkness that resists the kingdom of light not the power of light the kingdom of light the kingdom of light exists it's the kingdom of the sun and it is that kingdom that dwells in you and i and when the light shines the darkness wants to resist it but the bible is telling us be brave why because the grace of god if you can remove all your limitation from your thinking and say, I will not consider my limitation. I will consider the grace of God for that which I need it. I need the grace of God in my physical body. I need the grace of God for healing. I need the grace of God for my work. I need the grace of God for my relationships. I need the grace of God for the patience that I need to be able to stand and manifest the kingdom of God against the world that surrounds me and resists the kingdom of light. Even last night at our prayer meeting, uh, Chris spoke of that young man um, who has become born again in, um, in India, who is the eldest child of a, a, a Hindu, and he is, an, the, the father's an elder, meaning he is some form of a priest in Hinduism. Now, this 22-year-old met Jesus by reading the Word of God. He is completely surrounded by darkness and ways of thinking that are open to all of the demonic world. Thousands upon thousands of so-called gods, demonic gods. 
and yet he's standing by the grace of God. He found the grace of God. The grace of God found him and he's standing in the grace of God. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when we take on this understanding that I want to be strong in spirit as Jesus was because this is what the gospel is actually about. And I will continue in the study into next week but I want to finish on the thought of households. So if we continue on in verse 15, Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, he says, Brethren, you now you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Just want to stop there. So here's a household that has devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Before a household can become devoted, there has to be someone in that house that becomes the devotee, the person of peace, the, the one who brings the light in, the one who begins to minister to that household. And I know some of you whose husbands aren't Christians. This is a word for you because you are God's minister in that household. You are the person that God is bringing the kingdom of God into that household through and once a household is ignited in devotion to God, that household affects other households. It affects families. It affects communities. So this morning, I want to bring our attention to our own households and to pray for the restoration of each household that it becomes a household of faith. In other places, uh, the Apostle Paul actually refers to certain individuals as saying, and to the household of faith in so-and-so's house. God wants to save our households. He wants to deliver our households from those situations that um, are according to that which this world has created. Brokenness. Broken down mental health. Sickness. Disease. Torment, fear, all these things are the reproduction of the world system. Mental health was not the problem that it has become and continues to become when the fear of the Lord was present in society. But the worldly thinking 
has broken down society. It has broken down homes. It has broken down individuals. You know, this agenda of, you know, your child uh, must have the right to choose whether they're a boy or a girl, when they come into the consciousness of it. All this thinking is breaking down humanity. This is not God's design. It's not God's purpose. It is not God's way. And the church needs to rise up in this day and in this hour and say no more. We're not going to be silent. We're not going to be politically correct because politics is incorrect. And whilst we are on earth, we have the voice. We have the voice of sanity. We have the voice of peace. We have the voice of grace. We have the voice of salvation. We have the voice of God that says, come to the Father. That was the voice of Jesus. He said, come to me because I want to show you the way to the Father. We have the voice of love. This world is filled with confusion, with the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the things, you know, that grow dimly. Where the haves and the have-nots have a gulf between them. And the have-nots are far more than the haves. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that if you keep pushing the have-nots, the scale will tip the other way at some point in time. It will not go well. But the haves keep on pushing to see how much further the have-nots can go. And mine isn't a political argument or discussion. Mine is a call to the kingdom of God, which is here, but is soon coming to earth as well, because we can already see that the kingdoms of this world are in complete disrepair, and he will come, and he will take over, and he will restore this earth, redeem it and restore it. But whilst we are here, the church has a job, and we need to rise up. And let us rise up in faith. As it says here, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong in our own homes, in our own groups of friends, where being a person of faith often is shied upon. All I'm saying is, draw on the grace of God because he will work through you. Father, I thank you that you teach us by your spirit and in the week ahead you will continue to teach every one of my sisters and friends how to draw on the grace of God for every situation. It doesn't depend on our strength. It depends on us depending upon you. And we declare this morning and declare every time we have the need, we depend on you and on your grace, for it is sufficient unto us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.